Hi, I'm Melissa Chalker, Executive Director of the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. This episode of Aging Insights might seem a little different to you. First of all, you see that I'm wearing a headset. During these times that we're dealing with social distancing because of COVID-19, we have to do our business a little bit differently, and that includes the taping of this show. So I'd like to take this time to talk to you a little bit more directly. We've been filming Aging Insights for nine years, and in that time, we hope that the topics we've brought you have been relevant and helpful to you on your daily lives. But today, we're gonna to be doing it a little differently. Not only are we doing this via video conference, but we're also going to be talking specifically about what's on everyone's mind right now, and that's the COVID-19 virus. We're lucky enough to have two interviews with doctors in the field who are currently dealing with the virus, who also happen to be board members of the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. As you know, the New Jersey Foundation for Aging is dedicated to bringing you important information and resources to help you age well in New Jersey. And we hope that the interviews we've had today with our two doctors will give you that information that you need to stay up to date with the virus. First up is our interview with Dr. Joshua Raymond. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Dr. Raymond. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us um, for this episode of Aging Insights and give us a little bit of information about what's going on right now. Um, we know you're incredibly busy, so we appreciate you taking the time um, out of your schedule for this. Um, if you want to first um, and, and uh, want our audience to know also that in addition to uh, being a doctor that you are one of our um, New Jersey Foundation for Aging board members and so we are uh, particularly grateful for your um, ability to join us in that capacity as well. So if you want to maybe just start out with introducing yourself and your background and the type of medicine that you practice. Sure. My name is uh, Dr. Joshua Raymond. I'm faculty at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and I teach and lead the geriatric fellowship program that's based at Central State Hospital. Um, I work in collaboration with a group of 18 family practice residents and one geriatric fellow. I've, I've also been faculty at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School for the last 19 years. Great, terrific. So uh, if you could just give us an idea of the sort of thing that you're seeing right now out there and the experience and how this is impacting your practice. With sure. I, um, I should say when I say it, I'm talking about COVID-19. Right. Yeah. So uh, I, I work in, in long-term care facilities, and uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've started seeing um, cases coming up in the nursing facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we are currently isolating individuals, um, implementing uh, gowning and wearing masks to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 virus in the long-term care facilities. So I, we know that it's impacting long-term care facilities, um, you know, and that it's really a concern and the staff and yourself included are doing all they can to keep people safe. For those of our viewers who might be watching that are in the community, what can they do? Um, what should, what do they need to know to protect themselves and or to stay connected with loved ones who might be in facilities? Um, well, certainly washing your hands, um, re remaining social, socially distant, um, not going out unless you... Um, necessarily have to go out. Mm -hmm. um, as far as people in nursing homes, so important to reach out and communicate and call them on the telephone and know that they're thinking and they're, they're being with you um, and, and having support from the family. So, uh, yeah, I just really wanted to talk with you and get an idea of, you know, what you're seeing out there and, and what our audience needs to know. Um, you know, as we know, this is sort of an ever-changing thing, so I appreciate sort of the, um, the advice and reminders about that, um, you know, and, and getting in touch with folks because, you know, having some a loved one in a, in a care facility and not being able to go physically there can be stressful for both parties. So that idea that you can still pick up the phone and find a way to connect um, is, you know, is good uh, for people to know. In, in addition, reaching out to the staff at those facilities, mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're able to bring in and Skype or FaceTime mm -hmm. and, and you're able to connect with those. Um, there are families that are actually visiting outside, uh, tapping on the glass uh, yeah. windows and, yeah. and, and visiting with with family members, it's really touching when, sure. when you, you see that happen. Sure. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, your work with the federally qualified health center, and so how are how are things there, and what's happening there that um, that you can share with us? Uh, certainly, uh, the way that we're delivering medicine right now is changing. Over the last two weeks, yeah. we've had a vertical growth in telemedicine, and mm -hmm. we are now conducting nearly fifty percent of our visits um, via telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And um, and it really required our staff and our doctors to learn how to do that, and people have clearly risen to the occasion, and yeah. uh, and we're nearly at the same volume um, that we were mm -hmm. a month ago, and patients that we're seeing and taking yeah. care of in that setting. 
Sure, because we're, you know, we're so preoccupied with um, preventing and, and treating COVID um, that we forget that there are people who have regular medical needs and might have a medical question or they have, they're dealing with other chronic conditions that still need management. So um, the ability for the medical profession to think on their feet and, and, uh, and the, government to respond, the government and insurance to respond to the need for telemedicine has been um, phenomenal, I think. So I'm glad to hear on your end that you're experiencing that. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's yeah. Right. That's terrific. So um, in addition, you know, I wanted to just see if I could get a little bit of information from you about what you think the long-term ramifications are of this or, or, or what the lessons learned are and what we might see once we are able to get to the other side of this. I, I think preventative medicine will be uh, more prevalent mm -hmm. and the importance of immunizations and, and routine health uh, mm -hmm. prevention really will be important. I think telemedicine will be here to stay. I think the yeah. convenience um, of that and um, will, will uh, be a longing a legacy, a legacy of this. Um, and uh, uh, as far as uh, importance of advanced care planning, um, knowing that medical uh, conditions can change suddenly and, and so important. Mm -hmm. I, I think another uh, long-term change from this will be the importance of advanced care planning. Mm -hmm. uh, a month ago, a month and a half ago, no one would have ever foreseen what, what's taking place right now. Mm -hmm. and really sharing with your loved ones what your wishes are in the event mm -hmm. there is a medical condition uh, mm -hmm. where you can't express what you want done mm -hmm. regarding chest compressions, mechanical breathing, mm -hmm. um, and sharing that before there's a crisis is um, so important. Never a pleasant conversation, but it's better to do that before uh, a crisis. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that is a, a great um, point as well. And that lesson learned that, you know, medical decision making is is such a, an important factor. And uh, um, I guess, you know, in times like these, we have to, uh, you know, take the silver linings where we can find them. And so if a benefit of that is that people realize they should be having these conversations with their family and their loved ones, then, um, then that's, uh, that's a good decision. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Terrific. And so where um, would you direct people um, in regard to that or in regard to any resources? Where can people find more information? Where would you send people who have questions or concerns? Um, certainly the CDC website regarding mm -hmm. uh, appropriate uh, uh, protective equipment mm -hmm. um, and when to return to work. Mm -hmm. um, also, local hospitals have helplines on their telephone. For example, mm -hmm. if you call Central State, 732-431-2000, there's a helpline there that mm -hmm. can help you specifically with COVID questions. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Uh, and in regard to the medical decision making, um, you know, I know um, that Goals of Care uh, is an organization in New Jersey that provides some resources about that all the time, but in particular, they're responding to this. Um, so would you say that that's also a good place for people to find resources about that? Certainly, um, and if you go to their website, they're having daily uh, webcasts uh, mm -hmm. reviewing the goals of care conversation uh, mm -hmm. for lay people um, and, and just facilitating the completion mm -hmm. of a post form. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they have videos to assist families or individuals if they do choose to complete one. Great. Well, I think that is terrific information, and um, I do thank you again for taking um, time out of your busy schedule um, to, you know, have a few-minute conversation with us. I know this is a, a trying time uh, in your field, and so I, I'm really appreciative of it. Thank you, Melissa. I'd like to, again, thank Dr. Raymond for joining us for this episode of Aging Insights to tell us what he's seeing in the hospitals and in long-term care facilities. And in particular, I'd like to remind all of our viewers that if you have loved ones that are in nursing homes or other care facilities, or that just might be home alone, to please do remember to check on them and call them and still interact even if you can't visit. It's very important to remain connected during these times when we're separated by distance. And now uh, we'll hear from Dr. Vikantra Sharma, who's also gonna share with us what she's seeing in her medical practice. Hi, Dr. Sharma. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Aging Insights. I'm really excited that you could make time for us um, during this. What is, uh, you know, I know normally you're very busy, but I'm sure um, current times are making you even busier. I thought we would um, start with just a little basic introduction for uh, our viewers who don't know you. Um, not only are you a, a doctor, but you're also one of our um, New Jersey Foundation for Aging board members. And so we're, um, we're thrilled to have you um, with us in that, but also so, um, thrilled to have you join us today to share some information. So if you could just give us a little bit idea of your background and um, where you work and what type of medicine you practice. 
Um, hi, Melissa. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I am so proud to serve on the board of uh, New Jersey Foundation for Aging. Uh, it's some, a subject that is very close to my heart, taking care of uh, individuals um, to the best of uh, my ability uh, about their health and wellness. And uh, um, I am a palliative care physician. Um, I work for Visiting Nurse Association Health Group and the Visiting Health uh, uh, Visiting Nurse Association collaborates with other healthcare systems to provide care to um, vulnerable population having chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. So a palliative care physician provides um, uh, symptom control and uh, coordinated compassionate care to individuals with chronic advanced diseases like um, advanced dementia, um, advanced uh, heart failure, advanced COPD, advanced liver disease because of hepatitis or kidney disease, um, MS, ALS, et cetera, to name a few. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people are used to hearing um, about hospice, and I think they have a general idea of, of what hospice is, but I think there's a little bit more confusion around what palliative care means and how it's different from hospice. So could you tell us a little bit about that? So hospice uh, and palliative care are points on a spectrum mm -hmm. uh, in the process of a disease. So chronic illness is basically that your, your end organ is getting affected, whether it's heart, lung, liver, because of a particular diagnosis like hypertension, diabetes, hepatitis, etc. Mm -hmm. So um, there, are, there are medications that you take on a regular basis through your uh, physician or nurse practitioner to uh, alleviate those symptoms, to take care of those symptoms and, and control the progression of the disease. As far as we can make um, uh, physical changes in our lifestyle and our exercise and make dietary changes and respond to what might be our genetic predispositions, mm -hmm. we can control this to a minimal damage state. But when the disease becomes advanced, that it starts doing end organ damage, like uh, you, you start having to use oxygen for your lungs or you need to take uh, multiple doses of diuretics for heart failure. That situation is an advanced disease in the sense that it's already affected your end organ that was involved in the first place. Mm -hmm. So um, once that starts happening, people start becoming more dependent on activities of daily living, like bathing, um, dressing, walking, transferring from bed to the chair, toileting, etc. So that makes you more dependent and that requires you, you to have more assistance, uh, whether from home health aides or from physicians or uh, admissions into the hospital, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's advanced illness. That needs a little bit more intense involvement from your physician, from your nurses, or the hospital system. Mm -hmm. um, that's what most palliative care physicians deal with. Mm -hmm. Now, when the disease moves into an end stage, uh, a, a burnt out stage of the disease, if you will, that the end organ damage has set in, and there is very little that the medications can do to um, cure that disease at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, a lot of these individuals, when they are in end stage, when they're on three, four, five, six liters of oxygen or multiple medications, a lot of these medications interact with each other and cause side effects. So you're giving one to treat the side effects of the other. Mm -hmm. At that point, our, the medical science focus is to minimize the number of medications so there is minimal number of interactions occurring between them and to reduce the pill burden. So our focus in the end stage is to provide comfort measures only or comfort measures mostly. So we treat the symptoms much more aggressively, knowing fully well that their lifestyle is already limited, mm -hmm. that they can't do things for themselves and so forth. So um, that focus is a shift. 
Uh, and I really appreciate understanding the spectrum as you've described it. And, um, you know, I do want to touch again before we're uh, completed with our questioning here about um, sort of the, the difficult decision of making choices, um, right, about how we want our care to progress. But I'd like to get a little bit of information from you about how this whole um, COVID-19 um, issue is affecting your, your work and what you're seeing out there with your patients and with the hospital systems that you work with. So um, COVID is definitely uh, a, an immense challenge for us in palliative and hospice care. Mm -hmm. um, we're used to, as I said, dealing with chronic illnesses mm -hmm. and um, sort of expecting the decline. Okay. However, uh, we're now seeing younger individuals who don't have much of uh, end organ damage to start with, just hypertensives or just diabetics, mm -hmm. or sometimes even indiv younger individuals with uh, no diseases coming in <clears throat> pretty sick with, uh, with uh, coronavirus pneumonia. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, certainly very distressing. There is an incredible amount of suffering associated with an acute infectious illness mm -hmm. that most healers and physicians feel that they can get rid of, whether with antibiotics, antivirals, Mm -hmm. or other symptom management drugs. And I think uh, what is really incredibly hard uh, for me is to um, uh, address that personal sense of failure for not being able to treat somebody with an infectious disease. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't have a vaccination, we don't have any targeted antivirals, mm -hmm. although many trials are going on, as you know, on the medications. Mm -hmm. It just um, seems... Um, uh, that we're not in a position of uh, control. Uh, it's an unknown enemy, so to say. Yeah, and I can I appreciate that perspective from a, a medical professional who's attempting to to treat people and attempting to do all they can during this time to keep people safe. <laughs> and it must be frustrating to not have all of the the answers yet. Um, but it, I'm glad that you're out there um, with the the caring heart that you have, trying to do the best that you can. Um, and as I you know I mentioned you know you you practice in hospice and palliative care, and you know this is a point in time where we're not sure what people are going to need uh, in terms of their medical decision. I know um, recently there's been um, a uh, decision from the federal government that uh, you cannot discriminate against people on the basis of age or discrimination in accepting treatment because we know there was a lot of thing, a lot of things being talked about in terms of, you know, um, the lack of resources in treating people and how would we decide who gets treatment and who doesn't. I don't know if you want to touch on that a little bit um, about what you're seeing from your end in terms of um, refusal of treatment and things like that. When the going gets tough, you kind of stick with the basics. Mm -hmm. The basics of compassion, competence, mm -hmm. treating people fairly, mm -hmm. treating people appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the principles we are sticking to. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're trying to keep in mind uh, the individual as a whole person. We're trying to uh, look <clears throat> more carefully about what their underlying diseases might be that might be adding to a rapid decline. There are uh, scientific uh, studies that have been done in the past when somebody is uh, uh, declining and there are parameters, uh, medical signs, uh, lab values, et cetera, that we look at very closely to monitor their progression, whether it's their oxygen saturation, whether it's the intake of the oxygen that is required to maintain a normal oxygen saturation, their vitals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to stick to the basics and remain uh, as compassionate and as competent and as fair as possible. Mm -hmm. um, there are challenges uh, of uh, preparedness, uh, mm -hmm. so to say. Mm -hmm. um, the best way to treat uh, or to, to deal with uh, an epidemic is to identify it quickly, mm -hmm. early, early detection mm -hmm. and early response. And uh, if it is an infectious disease, you want to contain it um, mm -hmm. to a limited population as far as possible. But unfortunately, because this is an unknown enemy, we don't know how to treat it. Mm -hmm. They are coming into the final frontier, which is the hospitals. Mm -hmm right? Because people are sick, they're afraid, they don't know what to do with it, and they decide that hospital is the best place. 
um, again, back to the basics, your best place to treat you is your home if you have mild or moderate symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, quarantine uh, yourself voluntarily. Mm -hmm. Stick to one room, open the windows frequently, let air out, go outside in, in uh, the sunshine, make sure you're uh, sticking to a schedule, getting um, restful sleep and, and relaxing to kind of alleviate some of the uh, symptoms that might be coming and certainly uh, wipe down surfaces, surfaces uh, that are frequently used, wash your hands and don't touch your faces. Those are mm -hmm. the regular things that we want to practice. Mm -hmm kind of behave as if you have the disease, which is, which is hard to, to think for Americans, but I think we are in a stage that, that we need to behave as if we have the disease and not uh, overexpose other individuals because we know that this disease has an asymptomatic uh, carrier state mm -hmm. um, in younger as well as older individuals. Uh, although the you know the the um, people who are uh, far advanced in age, 80 years and older, have much more severe disease easily because, bottom line, they have a more number of chronic illnesses mm -hmm. that are at the baseline. So it's a complex play of all these diseases that, mm -hmm. that acts up. Um, I think so far, I haven't seen that we have come to a resource allocation a kind of thing. I, and I hope to God, and I'm optimistic, mm -hmm. that we will do the right thing even now and, mm -hmm. and prevent that stage from coming, mm -hmm. uh, that we have to uh, allocate respirators or, or healthcare supplies, etc. But I think one of the most important things that uh, community uh, dwelling individuals can do, community dwelling means outside of the hospital, you know, mm -hmm. out, outside of the lost frontier, so to say, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, we think about what can happen and pay attention and plan ahead. So if, if you have an unknown situation, you want to plan ahead. So in this uh, situation where uh, people are uh, sick with other diseases and they are afraid that they might contract uh, COVID-19 and have devastating consequences, they have to think about what is important for them, uh, what uh, senses, what uh, function is important to them, uh, being able to uh, breathe on their own, being able to think on their own. Mm -hmm. If they're progressing to a point that um, they, it is not salvageable, if they're going, do they want to be on a ventilator? Do they want to be in a hospital at this mm -hmm. time? Right. Um, uh, is CPR going to be futile, uh, uh, be uh, helpful, or is it going to be just right. prolonging the inevitable? Those right. kind of questions need to come in. So individuals who are at home kind of need to have a general care plan about, uh, you know, understanding of what their disease process is and what they would opt for, what kind of uh, intensity of treatment they would opt for. And people who are in nursing homes, or uh, if you have loved ones in the, in the nursing home, I think it behooves them to understand that this is important to address the goals of care now rather than if they are diagnosed with acute respiratory illness and need to go into the hospital. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that so much. Um, both not only the uh, the wonderful advice you've given about um, staying home and about the precautions to take, but also that last bit there about medical decision making, because we do know that it is um, important uh, at any time to know what your choices would be or how you'd um, like to be treated if you're ill. And so I think um, in somber times like these, it is important to make sure that you've had those conversations, right? Um, and and now, now more than any other time, it's really crucial to address your uh, healthcare proxy mm -hmm. uh, and tell them, you know, I never want to, you know, be in a hospital, in a, in a nursing home. I don't want to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that, that 
doesn't need to be the last place that I need to be. I think healthcare providers, physicians and nurse practitioners specifically are telling their loved ones because we are exposed to this uh, almost on an everyday basis every Mm -hmm. time we enter a patient's room right Uh, so i think we're more mindful i think we're more thoughtful about it Mm -hmm. um and if we take the time to reflect on it i Mm -hmm. i uh, bet that what is most important to us comes up uh forefront Uh, Yeah, again, I think that's um, terrific advice. Uh, You know, as you said, it is easier sometimes for those that are in the healthcare field to um, to have those views and to understand that line of reasoning. Um, But we hope that everyone takes that advice to heart and does think about this and and take the time that we have now to really reflect on what matters to you. So, um, Dr. Sharma, I truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and all that you're dealing with to talk with us uh, and share this information. And I know it'll be extremely valuable to our viewers. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Aging Insights. I'd like to again thank not only Dr. Raymond for joining us and sharing such relevant information, but also Dr. Sharma for taking time out of her busy schedule to share some information and advice with us. I do hope that you heed her advice on how to keep yourself and your loved ones safe during this time. And I'd like to also remind you that if you do or if you are still in need of services, you can still reach out to your county office on aging and you can reach them at 1-877-222-3737. As always, we try to strive to bring you relevant and important information through the production of Aging Insights. The New Jersey Foundation for Aging would like to thank all of our first responders and medical staff and everyone on the front lines for keeping us safe during this COVID-19 crisis. And we hope that you'll continue to stay with us and enjoy the content, even though we're bringing it to you in a slightly different format.